Um, hi, I'm Selena from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm here with Greg Cox, who is a media tie-in writer. And um, Greg, for, uh, for readers unfamiliar with your work, how would you describe what you write? Well, it's good. Like I said, you use, my girlfriend actually trained me to stop telling people I wrote media, I was a media tie-in writer, because like, Greg, no one knows what that means. Exactly. Okay? No, I write uh, novels based on popular movies and TV shows and comic books. Sometimes they are like straight out, just a straight up novelization of a popular movie, the official movie tie-in, or they're an original novel set in the world of, I have some show and tell items here actually. Great. My most recent um, novel is a new Star Trek novel and I've been writing Star Trek novels now for 25 years. This is a brand new adventure involving Kirk, Spock and McCoy but just not to show favorites and to support all of my publishers. Um, I have also written, wrote several novels based on the Librarians TV series. And very recently, I, I have also written a number of books based on comic book characters. Most recently, this is my most recent Batman novel, which came out about a year or so ago. So, you know, so I've done Batman, I have done Star Trek, I have done Buffy, Alias, Xena, I, I joke I've done everybody from alias to Zorro. Okay, you know. Wow, okay. And um, what can readers expect from your newest book, which is, I, I assume is the Star Trek book. Yes, this actually came out in November of this year. It is called A Contest of Principles. Um, and it is a classic, uh, as we say, TOS, the original series, Star Trek novel set back during the original five year mission. And this is a plot that actually sort of, you know, it's a big plot that involves, actually I, I separated our characters. It's about three different planets, three different worlds with, there's a Kirk plot, a Spock plot and a McCoy plot. And of course they all kind of converge eventually. But so I got to sort of, like, sort of three books in one. I actually was impressed by the cover designer who actually did a good job of actually capturing the idea that this is kind of, you know, Kirk's on one planet McCoy's on another and Spock is on another and they're all sort of pursuing their own. And there's a larger intergalactic political situation in this star system that they're all involved with. But it's sort of a sort of fun breaking them apart and sort of sending them off each on their three different adventures. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Now, what do you think draws readers to these kinds of books? You know, I, I have to think, you know, um, that there's like a Venn diagram and there's an intersection of people who are into this stuff, media stuff, the, the computer games, the movies and TVs, and readers. And therefore people want to, you know, people who are into Star Trek or Mortal Kombat or Godzilla love the movies or they've loved the comic book versions, but there's enough overlap with, oh, they're also book people. So it's book people who are also media people. Um, it's funny, ever since, you know, um, the rise of home video and VHS, people have been predicting the demise of tie-ins. It's like, well, why do people need to buy novels anymore when they can just own the movies and watch the shows? But oddly enough, like I said, I've been hearing this since, you know, VCRs and yet the books are still selling, they hit the seller lists. So clearly there is an itch that needs to be scratched to where if you're a Star Trek fan and you enjoy the movies, you sometimes just want to settle down and read a prose novel about them. Or even if you're a Batman fan, that you know you may enjoy the comic books or you may enjoy the video games or the cartoons or the latest movie. But if you're a book fan, you see, ooh, a novel about Batman. I want to sit down and read that on the train, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. so. I think I think people just can't get enough of it. You know, right. it, they, they love the characters and they just want more and more and more. And also, if, if you've only getting 20 episodes of the new Star Trek series a season, well, you know, here's, here's another binge. And of course, in the case of, say, honestly, in the case of, say, um, TOS novels, which have been now around for 50 plus years, and obviously, to a certain degree, we're the only game in town because clearly, you know, that show was canceled by NBC back in 1969. And, you know, um, if you want to read classic five-year mission books featuring William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, and DeForest Kelly, you know, sadly, you know, you have the 79 original episodes and it may well be that you know the 79 original episodes by heart, like me, 
and you will still be still so rewatch your box sets over and over again or watch them every Saturday night on MeTV, but you know, you, you want new stuff about, you know, um, plus we get to fill in, plus as tie writers, we get to like sometimes fill in the gaps and do the stuff that the movie shows didn't have time to do or to flesh out. There, there are stories, you're always looking for stories you could do book form that might work better in book form than, you know, uh, you know, on screen or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so what was the inspiration for your latest book? And Honestly, what were the and, and what were the steps you took to bring it from initial inspiration to the finished book? Well, in terms of just the steps, we'll backtrack a little bit. The, the, most tie-in novels, and where, this is whether you're talking the mm -hmm. librarians or Batman or Star Trek or Farscape or whoever, generally it's the same pattern. You because you, you're not writing these independently. Um, you, you you've been hired as a freelancer, like a hired contractor, to write a book for a publisher who has a license. I, I stress this always that I don't get up in the morning and decide, you know what? I love Winona Earp. I'm going to write a Winona Earp novel and somehow get it published. That, that's not how it works. How it begins almost always is with somebody calling me and saying, hey, Greg, we just got the license to do Winona Earp novels. What's your schedule like? You know, and you do, it's a very collaborative process because you've got to have everything approved by the licensor and the publisher. So typically, as with this book, it starts with, um, I'm called, unfortunately at this point, I've been doing Star Trek novels for like 25 years. So I'm in the enviable position of being one of the usual suspects. So it begins with, hi, Greg, we need a TOS novel for next year. What you got? You know, mm -hmm. I sit down, I write like a 12, 15 page outline. I send it to my editor who then sends it on to CBS. Typically, there's a bit of back and forth. Oh, we like this. We don't like this. Don't do this. Oh, we're doing this next week on the show. Don't do this. And we come up with a outline. And then I sit down and write the book. I don't start writing the book until the outline has been approved by both the folks at the good folks at Pocket Books and the good folks at CBS. And then I write the book. And after the book is done, honestly, then the manuscript is run by the good folks at Pocket Books and run by the good folks at CBS for any sort of last minute, you know twitchies and tinkers and typically the, you know, if things are working smoothly and indeed picking with Star Trek since the Star Trek book program has literally been running for 50 plus years now, it's a pretty well oiled machine. <laughs> you know, there, there aren't any big unpleasant surprises. And generally if they approve something in the outline, it flies. Now it's just sort of nitpicky stuff like, you know, oh, um, you're not allowed to drink coffee in the transporter room. I did not know that. Okay, so, you know, you can't, I mentioned that that's, that's just the sort of odd little tune-ups. I actually got that note once that, oh, no food allowed in the transporter room. You know, oh, okay, fair enough. You know, uh, that was for a Voyager novel, actually. If this is my, well, you know, I don't know, they ate a, a chicken salad sandwich in that one episode of TS. So, yeah, yeah, that was that one. Anyway, never did. Voyager, they don't drink coffee in the transporter room. Okay, fine. So, and obviously that is not a hardship for me. No, that ruins my entire plot. I have that whole plot to take. Okay, fine, I'll just, delete the scene where Janeway is sipping coffee in the coffee, you know, that, that line is gone. And I mentioned that's not just a Star Trek thing, that is the process with the librarians. Um, librarians was a little different because that was an ongoing show. I think TOS was canceled, you know, in 1969. So I don't have to worry about bumping into any new episodes. The challenge with when you're writing something which for an ongoing show, which is a work in progress, is you, you, you run into, oh, that's a great idea, Greg, we're doing that next week. Oh, that's a great idea, Greg. Um, that's our season finale, you know. Um, which is always kind of encouraging because when I get these messages and I do, oh, it means I'm on the right wavelength, you know. Right. And indeed, sometimes they'll warn me and tell me, for example, I remember with the librarians, it was like, okay, Greg, Egyptian mythology is off limits. That's our season three story arc. Okay, fine. I, you know, so it's always sort of looking for what haven't they done yet and working with them. Oh, well. We're getting rid of that character next season, Greg. So, oh, thanks, thanks, thanks for the head up, heads up, you know, kind of thing, you know. And okay. the same thing with Batman, and you know. Okay, and that okay. is how that is how tie-ins are written. Okay. But this book specifically, actually, it started with me wanting to write a book about Dr. McCoy. It dawned on me that oddly enough, I had never written a Dr. McCoy-centric novel, despite having written something like you know close to twenty Star Trek books at this point. 
And even though I love Dr. McCoy, as we all do, you know, that I had never actually, he'd always been there, you know, bickering with Spock and, you know, providing medical services and he's dead Jim and I'm a doctor, not an exorcist. And I never actually, actually written a McCoy centric plot. So I wanted to write a McCoy centric plot. And that actually kind of spilled out. I mentioned this. part of that involved, oh, I started with kind of like, I want McCoy to be front and center. And that meant actually having McCoy kidnapped and taken off to another planet so he could sort of get the spotlight. And then, you know, that necessitated, honestly, me, oh, well, now I have to come up with something else for Spock and Kirk to do because it is a Star Trek novel and I can't just shuffle them off to the side. I have to explain why they aren't rushing to McCoy's rescue. But, you know, so that McCoy could kind of be front and center and be the protagonist of his story, that meant giving Spock and McCoy a plot line now, <laughs> keeping Kirk and Spock busy elsewhere. And that worked out very nicely. And of course, I ended up enjoying fleshing out the Kirk storyline and the Spock storyline. But if I'm being honest, I started with, I want to write a McCoy book. And I came up with the McCoy storyline first and then had to figure out something else for to keep Kirk and Spock occupied while, you know, McCoy was front and center and was the protagonist of his own adventure. Ah, so. okay. So what kind of research went into writing this book? And um, if any at all? This work, I have to be honest, it, it varies. I do do a lot of research and research is part of, you know, um, this particular book, not a lot, because A, it's TOS and I have been watching TOS, you know, since I literally, since it first aired on NBC, you know, back when I was a kid. So I, I, I like to think I know the kind of that world kind of backwards and forwards. And of course, you know, this book involved a lot of brainstorming and we can talk about that later and coming up with stuff, but it wasn't like I need to, re it's imaginary worlds I'm inventing. By contrast, uh, the, the librarian's books always took a lot of research simply because, I don't know if you're familiar with the show, but it's about a team of kick-ass librarians saving the world. Their whole shtick is they save the world because they are librarians and they know lots of obscure information and know lots of weird stuff about history and architecture and science, which meant in order to write these books, damn it, I had to figure out plots that involved them knowing lots of obscure information about ancient history, et cetera. This is the Irish book. Um, it's called The Librarians of the Pot of Gold. So yeah, I was reading up on medieval Ireland and the real life historical St. Patrick and myths about leprechauns and banshees and, you know, and had to come back, come up with all sorts of weird esoteric lore that our heroes could deal with because they're librarians and they're smart and they, they solve problems by knowing things. And oddly enough, the Batman book, if you allow me to digress all over the place mm -hmm. here, that yep. involved a ton of research because this particular book involves Batman trying to solve a 100 year old murder mystery that dates back to you know, like, you know, the Gilded Age of Gotham City. And there are flashbacks. So I ended up doing a lot of research, just a good chunk of the book is set in modern day Gotham City. And I researched that by reading my various Batman reference books and you know, what's in Batman's utility belt. Uh, but there was a lot of research just for the flashback stuff to, you know, I was, devouring every book I could find about that sort of era. I reread The Alienist, I read Ragtime by a doctor I was watching, you know. Indeed, the real, the hundred year old murder mystery is loosely based on a composite of a couple of true real life murder mysteries from the history of New York. I kind of stole shamelessly from The Girl with the Red Velvet Swing and there was also a for now forgotten model named Audrey somebody who I, who's base, character based. So, you know, I had a lot of fun. My editor actually wanted a book that went deep into the history of Gotham City. So I had a lot of time researching just sort of, you know, Gilded Age Manhattan and turning it into, of course, Gilded Age Gotham City, you know. Wow. So what was your favorite research story that you've ever done? Oh God, I don't know. It's, um, it's always like you always learn this stuff and you, you know, I, I joke that being a writer is like being a college student your whole life. Both a good side and a bad side, you've always got a big paper due and you always have a big, but you're always learning new things and you're reading about. Um, hey, a recent thing, it was funny. Um, one of my librarian's books was about Mother Goose. 
And it was a true story there that honestly, I pitched that idea on the basis of two words, which was mother goose. I was talking to librarians people and I, had, I actually had an idea for another book and they shot that one down as well they should because, oh great, we're doing that next season. I, I kind of went to my backup plan and I kind of like, um, 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 Mother Goose, what about I do something about Mother Goose? Oh, we like that, great, go, Mother Goose. And I remember wandering downstairs to my girlfriend and saying, I think I just re agreed to write a 300 page fantasy novel about Mother Goose, you know what the hell am I going to do? And what I did was in fact go immediately to the library and I ended up learning way more about Mother Goose than I ever, and I dragged down the annotated Mother Goose and I found books on the history of Mother Goose and the real historical Mother Goose from I think Boston or something. There, oh, there was a historical Mother Goose and I found out that the, and in fact, this is where you get ideas. I discovered that in fact, the very first edition of Mother Goose no longer exists, it's a lost book. Wow. That there, are, that there are no known existing copies of the very first printing of Mother Goose. And that gave me my plot. Oh my God, that's my MacGuffin. They're searching for the long lost first edition of Mother Goose. Again, I did not know that when I actually said, how about I write a Mother Goose book? And you learn this stuff by researching this stuff, not only helps you flesh stuff out, but it gives you ideas. Like, wait, there is no, it's, it's, it's one of the great phantom books. It doesn't exist. There are no known existing copies of the first. Bang, I have a, that, that, that was, there's my plot. They're they're looking for the long lost first printing of Mother Goose, and wow. there you go. That um, is a great story. I got a whole book out of that. Okay, you know, and it won an award and everything. It was great. So you know, wonderful. So what is the was the biggest challenge in writing and putting out your your latest book? Hmm. Okay. The biggest challenge, honestly, was I think it took the most time is as I mentioned because it's basically a tripartite book. Um, and I have th three, it involves three different storylines on three different planets. Mm -hmm. And which meant I had to come up with three different alien planets, not just one, you know. And I remember that that actually slowed me down a little bit. I had to sit down and figure out the culture and the climate and the history and the politics of three different planets. And I remember going into a lot of effort in to trying to make them different. I wanted them to all feel different, whether they weren't just all generic futuristic cities, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and this went to just sort of figuring out the backstories and the politics of three different planets. Um, it also went into just dumb stuff like just, okay, I decided, you know, different climates. What, what's the weather like in this part of this part of the planet? Not that I did the mono universe thing where it's a, you know, all rain planet, but okay, the storyline over here, I kind of thought, okay, on this planet, McCoy storyline, it, it's summer. It's a beautiful summer. It's shiny. Oh, um, the, the Spock storyline. Oh, he's unfortunately, it's dreary. It's wet. It's damp. You have to dress up if you go outside. It's wet all the time, whatever. Oh, it's sort of pleasantly autumnal over on Kirk's planet, you know, um, just, and partly just it made sense. I wanted the three planets to feel different. But also doing you, because I'm jumping back and forth. Oh, it's raining outside. It's wet and cold and damp. We're back in the Spock storyline again, you know. Oh, it's a gorge, we're out in, and it did the, even sort of like, you know, the Kirk storyline, he's in the middle of a big kind of futuristic city. The McCoy storyline, he's actually out in the country somewhere. He's out at, you know, it's fields, lakes, kind of, you know, pastoral setting, you know. Um, and also just dumb things like the clothing and the, the fact that the, you know, the police forces have different names on the three different planets. And, um, on one planet, uh, the men are all clean shaven. And on the other planet, you know, adult males typically have big bushy beards, you know, just so that each of the three, because these are our planets, they're all basically humanoids. This is the TOS thing where they're all basically humanoid people. They're not weird silicon based crystal creatures or anything. They don't even have funny bumps on their heads. It, it's like, you know, TOS where you land down, there's, you know, but yeah, I wanted to make the, each of the three cultures feel different. And that was, I remember, you know, that was, I put a lot of time and effort into doing these dumb things. Like I remember on one of the planets, people smoke, which, you know, on other planets, they don't, you know, and that's, oh, if, if somebody's smoking a pipe or smoking, you know, well, you're, oh, you're on breakout now. I'm actually kind of pleasantly pleased I got away with that because generally smoking is not something you see on Star Trek. I think the general assumption 
which was a smart call. Actually, if you go back and look at the 1960s show that no one's smoking, it would be very, very dated. Everybody was smoking around the rec room of the enterprise. You know, I think the assumption is we've sort of generally evolved beyond, you know, smoking in the vast future of the 23rd century. But it stood to reason to me that on different planets that weren't part of the Federation, there was bound to still be planets where people smoked. And I was actually quite pleased. I was, well, is CBS going to let me get away with this? But okay, yeah, they're, they're not Starfleet, they're not Federation. People smoke on this planet. And I actually got some fun plot stuff out of this with, you know, clashes between the alien ambassador and, you know, Nurse Chapel because, sir, you're not allowed to smoke on the shuttle, you know, on the space shuttle, you know, on the shuttlecraft, you know, you know. Um, but it, I mean, you get these things and they did this, that's how books accumulate. You can start out with a premise, but you just sort of add these, to, oh, well, the smoking thing. Oh, that's a nice way to get some conflict between the alien ambassador and Nurse Chapel because, you know, oh, sir, you're not allowed to smoke on a Starfleet shuttle. You know, what do you mean I'm not allowed to smoke on a Starfleet shuttle? You know, and he gets cranky because of that. So, okay. but yeah, that was, that, was, that was the main challenge I remember was three different planets having to, and just making sure that the police wore one color uniform on another and the police wore a different color uniform on that. And it's rainy here, it's wet there, they smoke here, they don't have, poor, poor, poor McCoy has to wear this scratchy beard, fake beard for pretty much the entire book, um, which I didn't, I almost, I'll be honest, I almost thought that the beard thing was starting to become more trouble than it was worth because I had to keep reminding, you know, damn beard scratchy, you know, just so he could blend in incognito on this planet, but also it also was kind of a cute bit, and it kind of fits McCoy's irrational personality that he spends through a whole book, kind of rrr, 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 you know, <laughs> damn scratchy, you know, fake beard, you know, you can imagine, you know. Um, yeah, wow, that must have been difficult. <laughs> I have to admit. Um, I, even, I, I mean, I even got I managed to get in a sneaky little fun joke, which I'm still again, you know. If you can make yourself giggle, it's a good thing, you know. Where at one point Spock, and this is, you know, Leonard Nimoy Spock, POS Spock, actually confesses to Nurse Chapel that, you know, well, in my youth, I experimented with the beard. It was not universally well received, which is a little, well, just to pat myself on the back, a little bit of a meta joke because, of course, the the new Spock on Discovery who had a beard and that was controversial with fans. So, you know. But it's true, literally, he did have a beard as a youth, and that's a reference to, you know, nice little tip of the hat to discovery. It's also a little meta about, it was not universally well received, you know? <laughs> so what um, character did you love or hate the most when you were writing, and why? Well, no surprise, like I said, uh, we're repeating myself, but this book was meant to be my McCoy book. This yeah. was, this, this, I, I described this book as my love letter to Dr. McCoy. Yeah. Because indeed, even when Dr. McCoy's not on the screen, they're looking for Dr. McCoy. If I wanted to be puckish, I could have titled this book Star Trek The Search for Bones, you know, um, because you know, McCoy, while keeping about too much away, goes missing. And Spock is looking for Dr. McCoy. And Kirk is frustrated because he can't go looking for Dr. McCoy. And there's lots of, if only Bones was here, what would Bones say here? So it, his presence is all over the book. This is my love letter to. However, one of the things that surprised me about this book was also Nurse Chapel, Christine Chapel, who I have to admit, I realized that I had never actually done much with before. Um, she'd been in the previous books, but usually she's there in sick bay, handy McCoy, a, you know, scanner or a, you know, laser sack. This book was the first book I'd really done much with Christine Chapel because it's a McCoy plot. And if there's a search for McCoy, well, of course, Nurse Chapel is going to be involved in it, you know, and she's mm -hmm. going to be, and of course, she's also kind of needed because, oh my God, you need to perform first aid on the away team. Well, McCoy ain't there, you know, <laughs> you know, so right. she's kind of essential. She, she sort of insists on coming along on the search mission to find McCoy because A, she wants to find McCoy and also because, you know, you know if somebody gets hurt, you're going to need me, you know, if McCoy is hurt, you're going to need me. And I was actually pleasantly surprised. I didn't realize that when I started, first started talking about this book online, it, before it even came out, people were getting excited. Wait, wait, you're, you're doing something with Chapel. Oh, the Chapel's got a big part in this book? And people were actually excited about that, which may even honestly kind of encourage me to get, keep beefing up her part. So yeah, I actually, I had a lot of fun, actually. I, he's not a character I had ever done much with, but I actually had 
one of the challenges for me personally, as I've mentioned, not to belabor the fact that I'm old, but I've been doing this for a long time. So I'm always looking for what haven't I done personally, not just for the reader, you know, oh, I haven't done a McCoy plot. Oh, I've never really used Nurse Chapel perhaps as much as I should have. What haven't I done myself, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and I, it's actually, I, I've written in recent years, oh, I'm, this is gonna be a book where I'm gonna give Sulu some sunlight. This is gonna be my Eurora book where I'm gonna give her her own plot line. I'm always sort of looking for stuff, new things to sort of challenge myself and keep myself interested that I haven't done before. And oh. this time, like I said, Nurse Chapel, I had a lot of fun writing, and which was a surprise because the book was conceived of as a McCoy novel, but in fact, and I was pleasantly surprised to see that the fans were responding very well to the idea of Nurse Chapel actually getting a little love and getting some, you know, moments in the sunlight. Yeah, she doesn't usually, which I think yeah. is a, I think it's great that you were able to do that. And the other thing we did, and this was something that um, my editor Margaret and Clark and I both agreed on is we weren't going to do the unrequited pining for Spock thing. Um, which unfortunately is by how she's pretty much defined on the show. Mm -hmm. the other, yes. We kind of, yeah, you know, that's been done and no, that, that, so we, we kind of mutually agreed, Margaret and I, I enter Margaret Clark, we're on the same page, of, we're not doing that. She's going to be running around, she's venturing. She actually ends up paired up with Spock for most of the book they're out looking for, but no, we, we actually sort of assume this book takes place near the end of the fifth, of the five-year mission and she's over it, you know, the, the hopeless pining crush for, in fact, I kind of deliberately kind of drove a stake through that almost in one of the very first chapters where I kind of mention that, yeah, she, she's over that, that we're, we're not going there in case your eyeballs ray, oh, wait a minute, you know, Spock and Christine Chapel are going on a mission again. No. She, 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 she's over that. That ship has sailed. She's, she's. There, there's more to Nurse Chapel than simply pining over Spock, and we're not going there. And like I said, I kind of, as they say, lampposted that very early on. I think in like chapter three. That no, that, that that's what it was about. I'm glad she came into her own finally. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that, great. That, 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 that was something that, like I said, I remember Margaret felt very strongly about, it, and I was absolutely on the same page. That no, 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 we're. we're, we're Great. We're going to use Chapel. She's going to, she's going to, we're going to, she's not going to be defined as the one who's hopelessly pining over, over Spock. Okay. Okay. So what else can we expect from you in the near future? Well, let's see. I'm actually working on a novel on spec that doesn't have a publisher yet. So I'm reluctant to talk about it too much. I do have a couple of short stories that just came out in like the last couple of months. Which, okay. Yeah, to Great. Tell. Uh, one is a book called Thrilling Adventure Yarns, and it is a collection of, of old-fashioned pulp stories ah. featuring, indeed, a lot of the usual suspects, folks you've probably interviewed, you know, Dave Mack, Bob Greenberger, etc. I had fun. I actually wrote a old-fashioned sword and sorcery story, which, to be honest, was even fun, was actually a rewrite of a story I wrote in high school back when I was, you know, 15 years old. So I describe the story as a collaboration between 15-year-old Greg and 60-year-old Greg. It's the same plot, though, yeah, I discovered when I went back and looked at the original story that I like to think I've gotten better since I was 15. Okay, you know, it, it took, it, 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 it was a pretty thorough rewrite, but it was a fun project when Bob Greenberger approached me, hey, Greg, you want to write an old-fashioned pulp story? That like, you know, I wrote a sort of sorcery story. Well, what actually had happened, honestly, my, my parents moved out of their house into the retirement center. We cleared out their house and I found a stack of my old fan, fish, fan fiction from high school. And I found this, you know, I've got that old, you know, story I wrote in my spiral notebook, cursive, you know, back in 1975. Wouldn't it be fun to go back and revisit that story? And that's what I wrote here. Also, there's a new book just came out. It's called Turning the Tide. And this is a charity anthology. It's a fundraiser to raise money for the World Literacy Fund. It was done by the International Association of Media Italian Writers. And yes, there is an International Association of Media Italian Writers, and you've probably met many of them. Yeah. And the idea here was we would all write stories based on public domain characters. We, we've been talking about, a lot about licensed properties, Batman, which are all copyrighted. This, just for ease of simplicity, we all chose stories about Sinbad or 
um, Hopalong Cassidy or, you know, um, Thor and Loki characters who are public domain or Sherlock Holmes. Uh, my story is a story about Mina Harker from Bram Stoker's Dracula. So just so we didn't have to pay licensing fees or get anything approved and all proceeds go to the World Literacy Fund. And that just came out recently. And yeah, I, I've actually been, I'm re actually reading this book now. I'm reading one book a night. Um, I, yeah, I read a Sinbad story. I think tonight I'm gonna to read the Hopalong Cassidy story. So I, I've been enjoying that. That's been my sort of nightly ritual. I read one story a night before going to bed. So, Great. and in the meantime, like I said, I'm working on a, you know, on spec project, currently 96,000 words and counting that has yet, doesn't have a publisher yet. So I'm crossing my fingers. Uh -huh. I should probably also mention that uh, I have a couple of hats. I'm also a consulting editor for Tor Books, and I've been an editor ah. for Tor now for 30, 40 years. And I'm currently editing a line of a series of novels for Tor, which is a series of posthumous novels based on a concept developed by Stan Lee. It's called Stan Lee's The Devil's Quintet written by Stan Lee and Jay Bonasinga. And wow. Jay Bonasinga is a best-selling writer who was picked out by Stan before Stan passed away to write a series of, no write novels based on a new superhero team that Stan Lee invented. The first book is called The Devil's Quintet, The Armageddon Code, and I've been, I'm editing that for tour and there are three more books in the works. Wow. So that's, that's been one of the things that's been sort of occupying me, you know, the first book has been delivered, it's edited. It, I was looking at the cover sketches just the other day. And as we speak, Jay Bonan Singa, who has written several best-selling novels based on the Walking Dead TV series and comic books, right. is currently hard at work on book two. And I'm looking forward to that landing in my inbox one of these days, you know. So you're not keeping busy at all. <laughs> I, I'm doing what I can. I mean, honestly, <laughs> yeah, things slowed down a little bit during the pandemic, but you know, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But uh, yeah, one finds work to do. Right. I also mentioned, honestly, part of the trick to be surviving as a freelance writer is to have lots of, juggle lots of balls. I, I've actually had three careers going on for like years. I, I'm a writer, I'm an editor, and I also write the back cover copy for lots of other people's books. Really? I've been doing that since the 80s. I, I do that for tour or pocket books, other people, they send me the manuscripts and you may wonder, you know, where does this stuff come from? Who writes the back cover copy or the, you know, show and tell here, you know, the flap copy, um, that's me. Okay, uh, I, I have been doing that. That's another way I supplement my income because again, if you're a freelance writer, you're always kind of hustling for work and you've got the books you're writing. I've been working full-time as an editor for, you know, part-time, full-time, et cetera, as an editor for tour for years. And I have write back, I write cover copy. Um, I started out, this is funny, I started out writing the back cover copy for men's adult westerns. And I remember I got paid 80 bucks a pop to, you know, you know, Slocum ride shotgun on the road to trouble, which when I was a young starving writer, honestly kept the wolf from the door and kept me from eating macaroni and cheese a few times. You know, <laughs> 80 bucks a book for, you know, They'd send me, you know, right, you know, you know, Slocum ride shotgun on the road to trouble or something, you know, and I, 80 bucks a shot. I remember that was, that, that, wow. that, was, that was good money when I was a young starving author, okay. <laughs> In case people can't tell, <laughs> publishing does not pay well. <laughs> well like I say, if you're a freelancer, you're, 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 you're hustling. You, you require, <laughs> I am a freelance writer. I do not have a nine to five job. I have not had a nine to five job for 30 years now. Um, I used to work, by the way, as a full-time editor at Tor. I worked nine to five as a salaried employee. And then when I left, um, I stayed on as a consulting editor and I do a, various books on a sort of case-by-case -case basis, you know. Okay, um, now I do have some questions for you about being a writer. Um, what's your favorite part of being a writer and the whole writing and publishing process? Well, there's two process. I think part of it I mentioned before is kind of like, you are always a college student. And there's a drawback to do that because sometimes you have to drink lots of coffee and pull all-nighters because you've got a term paper due. But also you're always learning stuff. You're always, you know, I'm reading up on Rasputin and the Romanovs. I'm, oh, I'm 
discovering the literary history of Mother Goose. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing a story. I need to figure out about how, you know, to figure out, oh, I've got a guy doing a spacewalk during Saturn's rings. I've got to call my astronomy oriented friends and help me out. You're, you're always learning interesting stuff and you've always got topics you're interested in and you're researching. I'm researching true crime cases in, in Manhattan in the early 1900s. So that's fun. The other aspect for me personally, and this is part of the fun of being a tie-in writer, is a variety. I like jumping from genre to genre. I, you know, um, I've written spy thrillers, you know, crime um, science fiction, horror, mystery, helps keep things fresh. It's like, I, I like writing, say, Star Trek, but if I wrote science fiction 24 seven, that would be crazy. Oh, and then I'll write some CSI novels. I've written, I've even written some historical romances. I, I like the variety. It forces mm -hmm. you out of your comfort zone. Hey, great, we want you to write, you know, a Western novel. Okay, I guess I'm gonna be writing a Western novel. That's, that, 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 that's new and interesting. And plus there's also, I must say, the, the fanboy nostalgia factor. I, I am a lifelong science fiction comic book fan. My not so guilty secret is that even if I was not doing this for a living, I would be lining up outside to see the new Godzilla movie or the new Star Trek movie or the new Batman movie on opening night. And there is still a part of me where, like I said, my inner 12 year old is like, I can't believe I'm getting paid to write Godzilla, you know. Um, I, and it's like, you know, I have to play it cool sometimes. Like, hmm, well, let me talk to my agent and see what, you know, if we can work out a deal. But it's like, Planet of the Apes, you want me to write a Planet of the Apes book? You know, I still remember one night, and this was a few years ago, I suddenly was typing and suddenly realized that I was writing a fight scene between Wonder Woman and the Frankenstein monster. And I, I remember, oh God, if I could go back and tell, you know, 12 year old Greg that one day you will get paid for writing a fight scene between Wonder Woman and Frankenstein, you know? <laughs> you know, there is something cool about that. And I am not so jaded that I do not still find that there's something cool about, oh my God, I'm, I get to write a Godzilla book. Oh my God, I'm writing Kirk and Spock. You know, um, this is the stuff I grew up on. There is a nostalgia factor here, you know, and even there's some stuff that, you know, whew, I didn't grow up on or anything, but it's like, okay. yeah, twist, tw twist my arm, make me write a Green Hornet story. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Now, what do you consider the most challenging part of the writing process and how do you overcome that? Um, Honestly, that kind of goes back to what we were saying, trying to juggle the different hats. Okay. I, 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 I'll be honest and say that over the course of my career, trying to strike the right balance between editing and um, writing and throwing in the copywriting jobs as well. Yeah, you know, it's like, okay, am I working on the novel today? Oh, wait, I need, Tor needs cover concepts for that, you know, book and I'm editing and trying to juggle in different balls and sort of time management to make sure that, okay, you know, Pocket Books gets their Star Trek novel on time, Tor gets those edits on that mystery novel I'm editing for them. And, and sometimes you have to say no. Uh, mm -hmm. I, there have been times like, hey, Greg, we need you to write back cover copy for this mystery series. And I'm, like, I'm sorry, I'm booked up. I've got a, you know, Batman novel due next week. I can't do it, you know. And there have been times it's killed me where I've been offered tie-in projects. Hey, Greg, would you like to do, oh, I would love that. But honestly, I got, I know my limitations. I've got tight deadlines, 300 books due. I do not have, you know, time to do that. And I've had to say no to some fun projects. So to be, fair, to be fair, sometimes my editors are very accommodating. I'm like, hi, you know, can you push these, this book Especially if you're working in a in the same project, it's like, oh, um, can you push this book around so I can do that book? You know, and it it, it helps if, like I said, it's all in house. If oh hi, you know, you guys want me to do that vampire movie novelization, but you also want me to do that um, forty four hundred tie in. Can we adjust the schedules a little bit to make this work? And sometimes it's doable, and sometimes it isn't, and sometimes you have to let that movie novelization go because you know you're booked up. Okay. The movie um, novelizations in particular are always on a tight schedule. Those things, you know, the movie novelizations have to come out 
in time for the movie or there is no point. So there's not a lot of flexibility there. Right. Sometimes other things, it's like, well, you know, you know, this can, this, there's no reason, particular reason why this novel can't come out in July instead of April, but oh, the, the movie, the tie-in to the big feature blockbuster film has to come out, you know, so. So what's your, been your favorite adventure during your writing career? Um, a couple, of, hard to say, but a couple of, part of it is the whole social community thing, I would actually say that part of the fun of being in fact, a science fiction writer in particular is going to the conventions and meeting people and meeting authors and you know having the whole community thing. And I have in fact been going a little stir crazy because <laughs> the last year pandemic, you know, I have not been out and around. And, and in fact, it, it was killing me, I'll be honest. It was killing me that this book came out in November and I was not out besides just commercially doing the rounds and doing book signings at my local community bookstores and going to conventions and plugging it. But yes, also, you, you, know, you wanna show off, honestly. You wanna go out and talk to people and meet the fans and you can do some of that, thank God. Thank God for Zoom. I've been doing a lot of podcasts like this, but you know, I am looking forward to getting back on the road again. And I, this is the longest drought I have had in not going out and going to science fiction conventions in 40 years. I, I don't go to them as many as I used to when I was younger, but I usually go to a couple of them, you know, every year. And usually when a book comes out, you're doing a book signing at your local, you know, bookstores. Like, you know, if I lived in Massachusetts, I would be at your bookstore doing a book signing, you know. Um, so I miss that and that's fun. I will also say the movie novelizations, which we have not talked to about, that's when they literally, they send you the script for the movie right. and you turn the movie into a book. I, I am sufficiently starstruck enough that that's again, still kind of fun, especially when you get to fly out to Hollywood and see the sets and, you know, and it's cool. And, you know, get, on rare occasions, I've been invited to the red carpet premiere of the movie, hey, you know, it's cool to, you know, oh boy, I, when I did the first Underworld movie, they were very nice and invited me to the red carpet premiere at Grauman's Chinese Theater, and that's neat, you know. And when I did Man of Steel, they flew me out to Burbank and they took me into what they called the Fortress of Solitude, which is the room where they kept all the props. And I got to <laughs> see all the props and the costumes. And wow. I can just, when no one was looking, I touched Superman's cape, you know, uh, you know. Well, that, that, that's always kind of the, ooh, that's neat and cool besides just, oh, this is a nice deal. And it's a, hopefully get royalties and it keeps me gainfully employed. Oh, it's cool. I get to work on the new Batman movie. I get to be peripherally involved with the new Planet of the Apes movie. And that's still, like I said, I'm enough of a fanboy that's cool and exciting to go out there and, you know. Mm -hmm. And Great. sometimes you even get to occasionally meet the actors or something, it's neat, it's fun. And again, I'm enough of a fanboy that's cool, you know. I, I tell you one funny story. One time I was working on one of the Underworld books. I don't know if you remember, Underworld was the vampire versus werewolf franchise. Mm. There were several movies. And I wrote four books for that series. But I remember at one point, and this is not the way it usually works. Uh, There's a character named Raze who is a werewolf. And he did not have a backstory in the movie. And when I was writing one of the novels, I gave him this whole backstory just to flesh out the book. Because you're trying to flesh out a 100 page script into a 300 page book, you, you flush it out. And I got a call back from someone at Sony who said, so Greg, this, this whole backstory you gave Ray's, you, you just made that up, right? And I'm going, yeah, I just, I felt he just sort of shows up. He doesn't have a backstory. I needed to flesh out the character. Oh, I see. Hmm. Well, have you talked to the actor and act him, asked him what he thinks his character's backstory is? And I'm like, I can do that. And they said, oh, sure, here's his phone number. Why don't you call him up? This is not how it usually works. This has never, <laughs> ever happened. This is why I mentioned it. I'm still kind of blown away. And I was like, <laughs> you gave me his phone number. Okay. So I called him up. And the guy's name is Kevin Grievous, who I should mention is also one of the creators of Underworld. Besides playing the werewolf, he actually is one of the creators of the franchise. So he's, you know. And hi, um, this is Greg Cox. I don't know if you have, remember, we met briefly at the premiere for the first movie. If you, well, anyway, you know, so-and-so had, you know, said I could maybe call you and pick your brains about your character. Oh, sure. Sure enough, of course, being a writer himself and of course being an actor, 
he had, of course invented a whole biography for his character, which he told me about over on the phone. And I'm like, cool. I went back to manuscript. I tossed out what I wrote and I wrote straight from the werewolf's mouth, you know, <laughs> as it were, you know, his story. And that, like I said, I, you mentioned adventures. I, I, it, that's unusual. That's not how it usually works, you know? <laughs> I, I joke, I should have been, hmm, I'm really stuck on Kate Beckinsale's character. <laughs> Can you give me her phone number? Oh, of course. <laughs> I don't think that would have flown. You know, I don't think it would have gone. <laughs> like I said, that, that's a funny little peculiar story and adventure because, like I said, that never happens. And I remember being kind of like this. Sort of, well, have you asked Kevin what he thinks about his character's backstory? Oh, I can do that. Sure, here's his phone number. Give him a call. And by the way, we're still Facebook friends. We still talk occasionally, and we've talked on the, on the phone occasionally. So <laughs> that's great. Okay, so what is the greatest lesson you've learned thus far in your writing career? Hmm. Well, part of it, like I said, if you're going to be a freelancer, you need to hustle. Mm -hmm. I remember when I actually told my agent, Russ Galen, that I was thinking about quitting my day job to write full time. He said, well, you know, it's great. You, you, you're, you're gonna need to show initiative. You're gonna have to go out there and hustle work. And you cannot be humble. Uh, you know, freelancers cannot be afforded to be humble. You gotta like push yourself forward and, you know, hey, look at me, that's so an author, you know, um, et cetera, you know. Oh, I'm great. <laughs> Yeah, go around and, you know, et cetera. So, um, and again, also it helps to have several um, balls running. I don't, you know, I've always been careful not to, you know, put all of my eggs in one basket. I remember back when I was writing Star Trek and I, Star Trek has been very good to me. There was always the fear, well, what if my Star Trek editor gets hit by a truck or what if God forbid Star Trek goes away, you know? So let's write an Iron Man novel, let's write a Roswell novel, even though at times, honestly, the Iron Man novel and the Roswell novel did not pay as much as the Star Trek novels. But I liked diversifying. Diverse, it's like my it's like my financial advisor says, you want to diversify your account. So, mm -hmm. and let's keep my toe in on the editing, partly because I enjoy editing. I find it very satisfying to work with other authors. But also let's keep my toe in and not burn any bridges, keep my toe in on the editing. And you know what, let's keep, Someone calls me up and says, Greg, you want to write the back cover copy for this new mystery novel? Um, yeah, let's not shut that down. That's a nice little supplement sometimes. And, and if you're between, sometimes you are, there are times when you're sitting around like, you know, waiting for, you know, a proposal to get approved, waiting for an outline to be approved. Oh, if, you know, yeah, just two weeks ago, honestly, an editor at Torah called, she had a murder mystery novel. She wanted me to write the, flap copy for it. So that, that, honestly, that takes me about two days, one day to read the manuscript, one day to write the copy and bang, that was, a, you know, took a weekend off, made a little money. And it, and at the end of the year, I find when I honestly, I'm thinking about this because, hey, it's, we just passed April, I just did my taxes. I'm always sort of pleasantly surprised to see that besides the writing, which is my main gig, oh, well, you know, the editing and the writing the cover copy, that stuff adds up, you know, so it's nice, it's a nice, so I, that's one thing just as if you're gonna be a freelancer that helps mm -hmm. to help diversify. Okay, um, and so what other piece of advice would you wanna to give to other authors? Well, on the, on the writing aspect, um, I was actually talking about this on Facebook the other day. I have a rule. There is a Terry Carr, who is a late lamented famous science fiction writer. Terry once gave me one of my very best pieces of writing advice, which I was actually talking about the other day, which is when you're trying to figure out who the point of view character is, in any given scene, look for the character who is under the most stress, emotionally, physically, whatever, both. That is your point of view character. And I call this Terry's rule, and it has served me well now for a zillion years. And I, I stress it because it's obviously because sometimes you're writing a scene and you find it's not working. Oh, I'm telling it from the wrong, I'm telling it from the point of view of the wrong character. Who has got the most at stake emotionally? That is. If you're, if you're writing a scene, you're trying to figure out who, you know, the point of view character is. It, it, it's like I said, it's just one of my basic, you know, sort of, you know, compass point load stars. I use this like, you know, weekly. You're like, oh, this is who the, the this who is this scene about? And almost invariably it is the character who's under, who has the most at stake. And so, you know, this, this is Dimitri's scene. This is not Elena's scene. Write this scene from Dimitri's point of view. That is a great. And great I pass it on because, like I said, honestly, it's, it's, it's been one of my major just 
go-to box of tools. If I'm stuck on something, you know, oh, is this a Spock scene? Is this a Kirk scene? Is this a McCoy scene? Who has the most at stake here? That's who's, who's getting beaten up, who gets tossed through a window or who is, you know, heart is being broken. That's the person who's right there soon. The Great. other piece of advice I give, and this is where it comes from me wearing two hats, listen to your editors. <laughs> I, I'm a little schizo on this because I actually, like I said, I go back and forth, but I think I honestly think it helps me as a writer that I have worked both sides of the desk. I, I feel a little schizo sometimes because it's like, <clears throat> authors, temperamental children, you know, editors, you know, Philistines, how dare they mess with my sacred prose. But because I have been on both sides, I can see both people's point of view. And I'm not saying you must always do what your editor tells you to do, but I, you must, you know, oh, your editor may have a point and listen and take it into account. And similarly, when I am an editor, I, you know, remember it's their book. It's not my job to tell them what to do, but my job is to help them make their book as best as possible. And one of the things I have learned being an editor and a writer is to get over the knee jerk or response of, no, it's perfect the way it is, you stupid editor. Um, I will confess, I have it too, we all have it. You, you, you turn in a book to your editor, you want them to say, it's gorgeous, it's lovely, you don't have to do any more work, you know. I have learned from experience that when I get the notes, back on them, don't respond to my way. Just, this is actually, I just sit, sleep on it, go take the weekend off, assuming that the deadlines allow, you know, and come back to it fresh and get over the hump of, no, I did that on purpose, you stupid editor, you know, um, or I don't want to change it, it's perfect the way it is. This has actually also become part of my boilerplate when I write a letter to, as an editor, when I'm writing a letter to author, I say, look, don't feel obliged to respond right away. Don't start rewriting this afternoon. Don't write back immediately to tell me that, you know, I got my head on my ass, you know. Um, take it easy, forget about the book, go out to dinner, go mow the lawn, you know, take the weekend off, you know, sleep on this for a couple of days and we will revisit this next week. Which honestly, once you get over the hump of, you know, Oh, well, maybe you actually have a point there. Maybe that doesn't work or whatever, you know. Another piece of advice that was actually given to me by one of my mentors, the late great David Hartwell, and I've been lucky that I should mention I have had the benefit of coming around. David Hartwell, for people who do not know, was one of the legendary science fiction editors. He is also the guy who launched the science Star Trek book program at Pocket Books way back in the dawn of time. Um, David was one of my mentors. I learned a lot from him. And one thing he, I learned from him is that when an editor writer tells you, but, but, but I did that on purpose, the correct response is, of course you did. You know, um, no one is saying you made a mistake or you did it by accident. You did, I see what you were going for. Now, let, let me explain why I don't think you pulled it off or it's not quite working yet. You know, so it's really a nice way to get past these sort of, you know, defensive, Basically, this all boils down to I'm rambling. Don't get defensive about your work. When I say listen to your editor, I mean, doesn't mean you have to like, you know, yes, sir, you know, you say jump how high, but we all of us, at least I know I do, have a tendency to get defensive. And honestly, I've, this dates back to something, if you don't mind me rambling here, I noticed in writers' workshops, I have taken part in writers' workshops as, from, again, both sides as an instructor and as a student. The people who learn are the people who listen and who don't get all defensive. Because usually a lot of times, you know, you read your story and they critique it and it comes back to you. You should not be sort of, you know, the job is not to defend your story. The job is to listen to the input, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and it's a skill, unfortunately, to figure out which pieces of advice are bad. I mean, editors have bad advice. Your beta readers may have better advice, you know. But learning and learning to tell the good advice from the bad advice is you know, harder than it sounds. Although if 17 people tell you they don't get your ending, it's maybe the solution is not that, okay, they're all stupid. Maybe you didn't actually pull it off, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, to not get to fit, if you're sitting there listening to critiques and you're in your head, you're already writing, you know, your opposing statement. This is not a, you know, this is not a courtroom stage where they are the district attorney and you are Perry Mason, you know. 
listen to what they are saying and don't automatically get defensive, which I think helps you as a writer, you know. Okay, great. So are there any groups, clubs, or organizations that you'd recommend to other writers that might have helped you in your career? I'm glad, you know, that's a very nice thing because I was just talking about writers' workshops. Mm -hmm. um, I do belong to a couple of professional organizations. I belong to CIFWA, the Science Fiction Writers of America, um, which I'm proud to be part of. I, you know, I got, uh, and they, they do good work. Um, I've never needed to call upon their grievance committee or their you know, writer beware organization committees, which are meant to protect writers from say unscrupulous fake agents or whatever. But you know, it's, it's good to know they're there and I support their work. I belong to the International Association of Media Italian Writers. And that's a nice community because that's we're, we're really an odd little niche of publishing, which most people, even people in publishing often don't get. So it's nice to have somebody to just network and talk shop. And indeed, and, and you get some recognition, honestly, because honestly, media tie-in work tends not to win literary awards. So we have our own awards, scribes, you know. Um, and it's nice to sort of, you know, have a community of people who write Star Trek novels and Conan novels and CSI novels. And also just to network and, hey, have you heard that, have you heard the pocket books just got the license to do Winter Earp novels? Oh, well, maybe I'll drop, oh, who's the editor? Maybe I'll drop a line, you know. Um, Beyond that, going back in time, I attended the Clarion West Science Fiction um, and Fantasy Writing Workshop. Uh, Clarion West is a old and venerable writing workshop. It is a, an intensive six week course taught by professional, professional editors, professional writers. And that's where I met Terry Carr. That's where I met David Hartwell. That's where I met Vaughn de McIntyre, one of the original Star Trek authors. Um, and I should mention that Clarion West is based on Clarion East, which predates it even, it, it is probably the oldest and most established um, science fiction writing workshop, you know, in America. But I don't know of Clarion East. I, I went to Clarion West back in 1984, class of 84, and honestly, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. It, 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 it changed my life. I'm not promising it will change everybody's life, but it has beget many, it, it benefited me. From, I learned a lot about writing. Um, I learned Terry's rule about find the character who's got at the Clay West workshop, but also just also networking and connecting and learning pe about people. Um, you know, it was David Hartwell who told me, Greg, if you're really serious about this stuff, you should move to New York and get a job in publishing. I think the job wasting your life in Seattle, the phrase wasting your life in Seattle may have been used. Um, but, you know, so, you know, Clarion West, you know, helped me a lot and I, it, it's still around. I, I got the newsletter the other day. Uh, having the actual physical workshops was obviously problematic for the last couple of years because of COVID, but they are gearing up again. I, I get the alumni newsletters. And yeah, so Clarion West Science Fiction Writing Workshop helped me a lot i'm it's helped a lot of people and you know so i i recommend them highly and i am proud to be a you know one of the early on me in fact i'll mention my teachers the way clarion works is it's a six-week workshop and each week is taught by a different veteran science fiction writer workshop which provides you a variety of point of views you don't get one doctrinaire the year i went which was 1984 our teachers were terry carr legendary editor Vonda McIntyre, author of, among other things, the Wrath of Khan novelization, you know, um, Susie McKee Charnas, uh, Arthur Byron Cover, um, David Hartwell, and Norman Spinrad. So I, I like to think I benefited from getting different, who all taught us lots of different things. Uh, Norman taught, taught, emphasized teaching us how to outline a novel, um, you know. I remember Susie had us learn how to do public readings and practice doing public readings at conventions and things and reading our works aloud. Terry Gar talked about, you know, point of view and everything. So that was a very useful experience for me. And Amazing. Yeah. Okay. Now I have some questions about you as a person. Okay. Um, what is one thing that most people don't realize about you? Hmm. Well, this is. Not me. I, one thing I do mention, I always belabor this point, is that, like I said, the tie-in stuff 
is not generated by me. I, I, right. I do not wake up in the morning and decide I want to write a Warehouse 13 novel and make it happen. And I belabor this point only because this is not understood because whenever I'm out in public or in person, people are always coming up to me and saying, hi, I've written a 400 page Spider-Man novel. How do I get it published? And it breaks my heart because it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you know, the, the, the Spider-Man people kind of have to hire you and you have to send them an outline and you, 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 you can't just, and also it confuses people because I get letters saying, hey, Greg, I really love your books. You know, you should write a Star Wars novel. Thanks for the thought and from, you know, from your lips to Lucasfilm's ears. But you know, I, I can't just sit down and write a Star Wars novel. I, I appreciate the thought, you know, um, right. but you know, beyond that, I don't know. Um, I find I sometimes surprise people how long I've been around and how much of this stuff I've been, you know, writing, you know, not to belabor the point, but uh, I, I recently flabbergasted a friend by mentioning that I had seen The Empire Strikes Back when it came out in college. And he was like, wait, you were already in college, you know, when The Empire Strikes Back came out, you know, and, you know. I, I, I like to joke that I've been writing Batman since Michelle Pfeiffer was Catwoman. <laughs> okay. Uh, in fact, I have a funny Blackley comic story about that. I, I wrote the novelization of The Dark Knight Rises a few years back. And when I was out, in fact, you know, at the Warner Brother lot in Burbank, I was talking to some of the nice young people working on the movie. And I, I actually made that quip about, well, I've been, like, Rick, how long have you been doing this? I said, oh, I've been writing Batman since Michelle Pfeiffer was Catwoman. And, wow, that was the year I was born. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you feel a little old, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that I, I, but like I said, I, I, I'm you know, humbly proud of the fact that you know, I've been doing this for a long time, but I, I find it sometimes startles people. They just how, you know, uh, you know. Okay. But, you know I, I saw 2001 on its original release, okay? You know, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I have been going to science fiction conventions since Logan's Run costumes were fashionable. You know. <laughs> okay, I was so actually joking with a friend just the other day because it's like the 40th anniversary or something of. The Empire Strikes Back. That I think that I am of the last generation of fandom that did not grow up on Star Wars. Don't get me wrong, I love Star Wars. I camped out on the sidewalks overnight to see the original trilogy when they opened, but I was not remotely a kid. It is not a beloved part of my childhood. I was, you know, in college, you know, and me and my college friends all piled into a van and we camped. And yes, we camped out on the sidewalk outside the theater to see Return of the Jedi opening night, but I, I I don't remember playing with my C-2PO dolls as a kid. You know, I think I'm of the last generation that, you know, I was kind of grown up by the time Star Wars came along. You know, I grew up on Planet of the Apes and Logan's Run and TOS, you know. Okay, so what is or are your passions when you're not writing? And how do you hmm. make, how, to make, how do you make time for your non-writing hobbies and things that you love? Well, the advantage here is honestly, um, I am fortunate that I've managed to turn my hobbies into my job. Um, right. Watching Star Trek, reading comic books, you know. I, I was rewatching Conan the Barbarian on like BBC America last night, you know. <laughs> um, so it gets a little, the line between my hobbies and my job gets very little blurry sometimes. I'm like, oh, hey, I'm going to go to the comic book store, pick up my weekly supply of comic books on Wednesday, and oh, come home and work on my Batman novel, you know. Um, but yeah, beyond that, I, you know, we, I like to go out, we have to go out and travel. I like, again, I like conventions. Conventions to me are not, conventions are not to me entirely a professional event. I mean, honestly, I'm not even sure if they're cost effective, if I, you know, the travel and everything and the hotels, you know, I, I like getting out and going to conventions. Conventions are my happy place. I was again, going to conventions before I started doing this for a living. So again, it's, it's recreation, you know, so going to, you know, monster vampire movie film festivals and uh, uh, going to Star Trek conventions is fun and recreation. And it was fun and recreation before I started doing it. And it's still fun and recreation. So it, it's, it's the blurry line here. And even socializing, half my friends, I, I've met through science fiction fandom or I've met through, you know, conventions and everything, so. Right, it, I it understand that. 
<laughs> okay. Um, so what does your writing space look like? And what do you need to have around you when writing or editing? Um, I, I have my own office and I really like that. I am not someone who can sit and write in the middle of a crowded, noisy Starbucks. I can do that. I can, I can brainstorm that. I will actually will escape to you know, a coffee shop if I need to just sort of sit down with legal pads and index cards and plot a book out and brainstorm. But when it comes to doing the actual composing words together, I, I like it. I like having my own office. I like being able to close the door, shut myself off, put my music on, um, and, you know, write. I will say that my essentials I have are like, um, Oh, and I, I got to have my, you know, have my Roger's Pizarus. Right. Again, I'm old fashioned. I'm aware that there are online versions. I still love my trust. And when it, I, I, I used this book until it fell apart and I went out and found another one, you know. Um, but so, you know, I've got, I've got my office here. I got a computer set up. I've got, you can't see it. I have my entire two shelves of reference works on Star Trek, you know, my, you know, Klingon encyclopedias and Star Trek chronologies and technical manuals, you know, at, 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 at close hand. And, you know, I like to be able to close the door and just sort of do the immersion thing. Mm -hmm. um, put yeah. on the music, etc. you know. Okay, so you prefer music rather than silence? Oh, definitely. In fact, I was watching your interview with Dave Mack, and he and I are on the same page there. That in that I need music, but I do nothing with words, nothing with lyrics, unless, okay, I'm listening to opera and the lyrics are in Italian and I don't speak Italian. Yeah, I can't have other people's words in my head. I, I need music and mostly movie soundtracks and often carefully curated movie soundtracks to depend on what I'm writing. Depending on how organized my shelves are, I have like the Star Trek music shelf. There's like the spy music, sh movie music shelf. There's even the pirate, they kind of <laughs> small pirate, you know, music shelf. Da, 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 you know. And I sort of adjust, if I'm writing a vampire novel, it's time to put the spooky, creepy, atmospheric, you know, vampire mu music on. Uh, well, well, very enough so I don't get bored. So, and it mm -hmm. helps you go. And I've also like, you know, I've got my adrenaline bu boost music. There's sometimes, you know, you know you're writing, you're putting on a long day, your energy starts flagging, the coffee ain't doing it. You know, you, you put on something, you know, rousing. Uh, one of my go-tos is the musical score for the seventh voyage of Sinbad, the Harryhausen movie. It has this really sort of, you know, da, 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 da. And it gets your juices flowing and kind of gives you a musical sugar boost, you know, uh, energy <laughs> boost, you know, to kind of keep going if you're sort of, you know. But along the other side, if you're writing something maybe sort of gentle and lyrical, you kind of write, put on something. You, maybe you don't necessarily want to have a booming, pounding soundtrack. If you're writing that sensitive, poignant deathbed scene, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say it's for Star Trek. Um, my my go tos are the Wrath of Khan for the Wrath, uh, or the soundtrack for the Wrath of Khan, or First Contact. But if I'm writing something quiet and lyrical and introspective, I actually go for the soundtrack for Insurrection. Hmm. Which is funny because honestly, Insurrection is not one of my favorite Star Trek movies. Uh, no, uh, but it is a it's, it's a gorgeous soundtrack, and I will say in all honesty, I have listened and enjoyed the soundtrack album way more times than I've ever watched the movie. Um, but no, it, it it's kind of you know that's sort of a gentle movie, and the music is kind of gentle and lyrical, and that is very good if I'm writing a Star Trek novel, and I'm writing sort of a quiet moment that is not a you know photon torpedoes and phasers blaring. I, 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 the, the, the Jerry Goldsmith soundtrack for Insurrection is lovely and I listen to it often, you know. Hmm. So okay. I'm writing something more sensitive and lyrical and gentle. You know, yeah. is, are there any um, special things that you need to eat or drink that, um, that you need to have with you? Well, I think there are two kinds of writers in the world. There are the ones who live on booze, the ones who live on coffee. And I consume mass quantities of coffee. I, I also kind of like have munchies to work on. Uh, when I was younger, I ate, you know, Twizzlers and things. These days, I try to eat. I, I tend to eat microwave popcorn, preferably with not lots of heavy cholesterol, butter and cheese sauce on it. You know, just a little <laughs> salt. But you know, so these days my staples are 
um, coffee, um, and microwave popcorn, and maybe some nice sliced um, apple slices, a nice granny apple. Because again, I try to eat a little healthier. In my younger days, it was like kill off the two liter bottle of Coke and eat, you know, licorice and M and M's, and I try to eat a little more healthier these days. <laughs> but, okay. And um, a lot of times, uh, writers have furry or feathered or uh, otherwise non-human companions um, to help them with their uh, writing. And uh, oh. do you have <laughs> do you have any or uh, what do you have? And do we they help have. or hinder? Uh, honestly, at our height, we had four cats and a dog. Wow. At present time in old age and attrition. We, we are currently, for the first time in a long time, kind of animalless. Uh, um, I suspect there will be another dog or another cat in our future. At the moment, during the pandemic, things have been kind of you know, quiet, you know. So we, we, our last surviving cat passed away a few months ago. We are currently. Okay. And honestly, at the moment, we're kind of taking the enjoying the break as much as, like I said, we've always had animals in the house. At our height, we had four cats and a dog. At the moment, we're kind of, oh, we don't actually have to walk a dog. We don't, we can actually, we're actually looking forward to maybe once the world opens up again, taking some vacations where we don't have to arrange for a dog sitter or a cat sitter or anything. So we're, we're, we're kind of, you know, taking a breather from, from furry companions at a moment, though, like I said, it's, yeah, we, we have always had animals, cats and dogs and everything. So, yeah, that, that, that is no doubt. In fact, I, you know, we, like my girlfriend was looking at Pet Finder this morning. So we will see. But we, yeah. you, you catch us at a moment when we are briefly between pets. At the moment. Ah, I see. Okay. Um, I only have two more questions for you. One, uh, where can people find your work besides Annie's with Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm going to um, put in a plug, which I do at every single video uh, for Annie's, and you can um, you can get Greg's books at uh, Annie's if you call us at 508-796-5613, uh, and you can uh, you can send us email at orders at anniesbooksworcester.com. And where else could people find your books? Well, in generally, you know, where 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 you know. Um, commercially published uh, books are, are, are found. Um, you know, your usual outlets, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, even independent bookstores. Some of the more comic booky stuff, uh, the Batman novels, uh, I have an X-Men novel and Avengers, you know, can be found actually at your neighborhood comic book store possibly if they also stock prose novels. And of course these days, many of them are available in ebook form. Um, I'm old fashioned, I still tend to read dead tree books. But I will say the ebooks are great. And uh, one nice thing about ebooks is that they have helped bring the, keep older books in print. I mean, you know, if you go down to your mall, as I did yesterday, for the first time in a year, I went to a mall for the first time in a year. Wow. Because I'm now fully vaxxed. It was Brave. <laughs> and, you know, I looked, and yes, they had my most recent Star Trek novel there. But chances are you're not going to find a Star Trek novel I wrote back in the 1990s you know, at, at your local mall or even unless you're at a used bookstore, you know, but it's nice that I, that those books have got in our life. I, they, they're most of the, most of a lot of my older books are available on ebook. So, and it's nice that people are rediscovering them and I'm, I even get some royalties, you know, um, for books that I wrote back during the Clinton administration, you know. Um, so yeah, they're available by ebooks and, you know, most, the newer stuff will be on sale at both, you know, uh, bookstores like yours at you know your local mall outlet online and even like I said maybe even your neighborhood comic book store yep and we could order them for you yeah. even the older ones too um, or some of the older ones maybe not all of them but uh, and, 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 and things get can. reprinted and things get back and I'm, I'm always sort of amazed hey give me a second I'll step away from the screen Show and tell. I actually wrote these <laughs> books again back in the 90s, back during the Clinton administration, Bill wow. Clinton, you know. But just recently they were reissued by Titan Books, which amazed me. Honestly, I never thought these books were going to see the light of day again. You know, it's nice. And occasionally people would show up with used paperback copies at bookstore, 
as convention, but no, these recently re reissued. A lot of my older Marvel books actually are getting reissued these days as ebooks, as audio books, and or new new editions. So it's it's kind of cool seeing the end of recent life and having. So a lot of your books. books. When people come up to me, well, how can I get your old Iron Man books? Well, they're kind of hard to find. You got to go on eBay. Oh, well, hey, they're back. You know, so. And so a lot of your books are on audio books. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any say in that or or not? Um, I don't have any say as to whether or not they get made um, or how you call, but I, I do work with them, particularly with the Star Trek books. Uh, my last several Star Trek books have been on audio, and I actually have a very good relationship with the audio people. They reach out to me, and it's now actually become sort of routine and part of the process that at some point I provide them with a pronunciation guide. Ah. Because, you know, you got this weird, oh, how do you pronounce the planet Azalore? So this character, Grzgnok, how is, you know, Z, 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 T, T, you know. So actually, it's now actually part of, again, I have to say the Star Trek thing is a well-oiled machine at this point. Yep. You know, um, you know, no, it's now almost sort of standard that at some point the nice folks at the audio company reach out to me. They ask me for a pronunciation guide. They may have questions. How do we pronounce this alien, a, weird alien name? I write back to them and we, we coordinate, you know. It is sometimes embarrassing to admit that I had not actually thought about this, that it, well, it just looked weird on the page. And I will say I'm possibly more conscious now of making them pronounce, pronounceable. In the old days, I would come up with you know, crazy weird alien names that had lots of asterisks and ampersands in them or something, you know. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then I remember the audio people would come to me, well, how do we pronounce Oh, I, I hadn't actually thought about that. It just kind of looked cool and alien on the page. So I think I honestly am a, a little more, re, more reluctant these days to just throw random consonants and toss in, a, you know, some hyphens and apostrophes into a word and, you know, realizing that some poor actor is going to have to actually read these <laughs> words, you know, so. Okay. So yeah, that, that, that's actually a process these days. And like I said, I don't, I, I don't have a say as to what, who the audio rights get sold to or which books become audio, which ones don't. But yeah, it, sometimes the audio people. Well, one quick story. I, I remember once I was actually invited to the taping of one of my audio books. And that was funny because it was actually very weird. It actually creeped me out. And I, I huh. do actually be, I was surprised by my visceral reaction was it was weird to hear someone else reading my words, if you know what I mean. And oh, and they're, as well they should. And, oh, and oh, that, that's not how I heard it in my head. And oh, that, that performer is putting a different spin on that dialogue, that's, is doing a different line reading. It actually took me, again, it's kind of like I mentioned when you get the editorial notes back from your editor and you have the knee jerk response of no, it's perfect the way it is. I was surprised that I was kind of like, I got used to it after about four or five takes that my first visceral response was, and I was very good. I sat on my hands and didn't say anything because it was very nice of them to courteously invite me to the taping. I wasn't going to be a prima donna here, but I was amazed at how it did, honestly, between you and me, kind of creep me out a bit. Like, this yeah. isn't how I heard it in my head. You know? <laughs> I can imagine, you know, hearing yeah, somebody it was else. It was, it was sort of, you know, doing it. Yeah. It was odd. It was a funny experience. I was, I was intrigued, not so much by the, the Performance as by my own sort of weird <laughs> visceral reaction to it, which I had not anticipated, you know. Okay, I just have one more question for you. Mm -hmm. How can we follow your work and, uh, and share your awesomeness? Well, hopefully now that the world is opening up again, <sighs> I will be out hitting the road again and going to conventions and such. I have already agreed, hang on, my mouth is getting a bit dry here. I have in fact already agreed to be a guest at ZenkiCon, which is our local science fiction convention here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania in March. So I will be there in public and I'm sure my convention schedule will open up now again that the world is opening up again. Mm -hmm. um, I also, so I, I, I'm not a super present on social media. I, I'm not on Twitter or anything. And, uh, I don't have my, but I do honestly hang out a lot online at a lot of fan sites, uh, at the Trek Bolton boards, Trek Facebook pages, 
uh, um, Constellation, which is a Facebook page, which is sort of a virtual um, science fiction convention for all of us folks who are going stir crazy without any real conventions. I, I, I spend more time on, you know, um, Constellation than my schedules would probably allow. So <laughs> it, 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 a lot of the standard, like I said, there's Trek, Trek bulletin boards, Trek, if there's a Facebook page about Trek book and Trek literature, I, I, I show up and hang out because I'm looking to see what people say about my books and just to see about the news and what people are saying about my friend's books, you know. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I'm out there and about, I don't have my own designated, and I'm very bad about updating my website. I do have a website, but I, I'm bad about updating it, mostly just updating news. I, I, you know, one of these days I need to join the 21st century and get a Patreon page and get my own YouTube channel and all that modern. Do you have a Facebook stuff. page? I, I, I actually have two Facebook pages. I have okay. one, my personal one, which is where like, you know, birth, you know, friends, relatives, birthday parties of my nieces and nephews. And I have a Greg Cox author Facebook page where, you know, I talk up, but I'm not besides plugging my books. I just talk about what I'm watching and funny things and funny moments on last night's episode of Legends of Tomorrow or whatever. So, you know. Okay. Where I, I chat about Fanny stuff because as we discussed, the fine line between my job and my hobbies and my fanish activities. And and yes, last night I was watching the new episode of, you know, um, Legends of Tomorrow. And this morning I was chatting about the new episode of Legends of Tomorrow on various fan message boards, you know, because I'm, like I said, my I, I, I will be standing in line to see Black Widow when it opens, regardless of whether or not I'm doing an operation or not. Which sadly I'm not, but okay, but okay. you know. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's about all that we have time for. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much for uh, for joining me, and uh, hopefully, if you ever get to the Worcester area around around the Boston area, um, you'll come and visit us at our store. Good. I that sounds great. I I, I generally what like I say if I'm in a visiting or traveling, I can't resist checking out a local bookstore. In fact, I have a pretty good radar. I've occasionally amazed you know, like relatives, like, Greg, how how did you find the comic book store in <laughs> you know, you know where I have a Colonial Williamsburg or whatever? Yeah. Well, I just it, you just find my, it. My spider senses kind of guides me to find. Or if you get to Boscon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I went to, I, 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 honestly, I've not been there as much as I, I went to a world con in Boston many, many years ago. Norris con, probably, but yeah. All I really remember is the convention center. I, it was one, I, I, one of these, I didn't get out and see the city as much as I, I regret that I did not get out and see as much of the city. I mostly was in the convention center running around doing fan stuff. Ah, okay. Well, anyways, hopefully we will see you then. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks again.